My name is Carol Reese. I'm a master gardener with Rutherford County. Today we're going to talk about warm vegetables. First thing with any vegetable garden, you want to check your pH, soil test, fertilizer needs. I checked at the Ag Center and the soil tests that they send in for you now are up to 20 bucks. You can find an alternate uh, source to do your soil tests. Um, it will give you your pH uh, and your fertilizer needs. It will also tell you what might be, if you have a specific plant in mind to grow in an area, say you want to grow a lawn or you want to grow an orchard or you want to grow apple trees or you want to grow ginger plants, it will tell you if that's an appropriate thing for you to be trying to do based on the results of your pH test uh, or and your soil test. Um, but you could, what you do if you want a soil test, is you, you go around to the spots where you're going to plant and you dig a hole about four foot down. You cut the vegetation off the top of the hole. You don't want to include any organic material in then more than you, you have to in your sample. And you dig a hole about four, inch, four to six inches down. You scoop up that dirt. You put it in a bucket and you do that in four different sites around. So you mix it all up and then you take it to the uh, ag center and you'll put it in a box, fill out some paperwork, and they'll send it off to you for 20 bucks. You can get it done, probably, uh, you can package it up and send it off yourself if you would like, but I don't know how you're gonna ship for less than that. Um, or you can find another place to do your soil test. Or you can figure out how to establish what's in your soil on your own, but you're not gonna get your micronutrients and your macronutrients and that's and recommendations for planting stuff. But you can take soil out of your yard, put it in a jar with some water, shake it up, and then set it down and look at it. And you'll see that um, your top layer will be organic material because there'll still be some organic material in it. And then your next layer will probably be, um, let's see, sand or clay? Your next layer will be clay. It'll, it'll, it'll break out in bands. And then underneath that will be sand. And you'll be able to see what proportions you got and how likely you'll be able to plant what you... Uh, when in doubt, just add more organic material. Add more organic material. Add more organic material. Uh, manure or compost is just grand. But if you don't want to do the soil test, add more organic material. And, and that's how it works. Thank you. Okay, we're going to cover warm weather vegetables, and it's getting a little late to put in a warm weather garden because when we get hot here, we really get hot. Um, first thing we're going to cover is bush beans and pole beans. Bush uh, beans grow best in slightly acid soil, so that's going to be a pH between 6 and 7. 7 is neutral. Uh, clay or silty loams are better for bean production than sandy soils. Use well-rotted manure or compost at planting to increase soil organic material. Um, silty loams is, is the, uh, it's the stuff you drag out of your gutters. It's the stuff in the bottom of the creek. It's, it's all organic material. It all breaks down. It's the first thing to float away in a rainstorm because uh, organic, uh, the silt is lightweight and when it rains, that stuff percolates to the top and just washes right away. You ever noticed on your driveway, um, the stuff that comes down from the, the higher elevations, like on a hill or whatnot, is always the pine needles or the grass clippings. There's your silty loam. It's always lighter. It's always going to float away, and that's what you need to have in your garden. That's the thing you need most to have in your garden. Well-rotted manure compost. We're back to the uh, manure and compost to increase your soil organic material. Beans, all beans, all peas, all legumes. Legumes is anything that produces its seeds in a pod. A mimosa is a legume. A catalpa is a legume. They form a symbiotic relationship with plants. There's a, uh, it's called rhizobium, and it coats the seed. The bacteria rhizobium fixes nitrogen, but it only exists, it primarily exists in uh, a symbiotic relationship with a bean or a legume plant. Beans, peas, I'm trying to think of something else. But there's a lot of pod-bearing seed uh, plants out there. And what that does is in the air, we have 70% nitrogen, 13% uh, oxygen, and other stuff. The, in the soil, we have l very little 
ni naturally occurring nitrogen, only when it, things are rotting, when plant material is rotting. The rhizobium takes nitrogen out of the air and it fixes it in the soil, in the plant, so the plant can make, can, can use it. The plant can't use nitrogen in the air, but the plant can use nitrogen in the soil. And that little bacteria, rhizobium inoculum, will fix it so it's available for the plant. Clover also is a legume and it also fixes nitrogen. Yes, sir. Yes. So if you have leguminous plants or leguminous uh, manure, you know, where your material is breaking down, there'll be more nitrogen and, and you want to incorporate nitrogen in the soil because the plant needs the nitrogen. It doesn't, it needs the nitrogen. Um, so you get this rhizobium inoculum, it comes in a powder. You coat your seeds in with it before you plant them in the soil. You, according to the packet, some package directions I've seen say you just pour the water into the packet with your seeds. Um, I've always soaked my uh, legume seeds with the rhizome, rhizobium in a container for 24 hours before I actually put them in the soil. And then you're good. And then whatever is left in the package, like the little watery stuff, you just pour it on top of the beans you just planted. Um, uh, it says uh, to uh, get the ones that's suitable for beans, um, and not specifically for peas. I don't, I've always just used the one packet. I've never gone and gotten pea rhizobium or bean rhizobium. Let me know if you try it and there's a uh, difference in the performance that, that you get. And according to the information I got off of uh, an extension publication, you can plant two weeks before frost date with the beans or the pole beans. Bean, bush, and pole lima. Uh, pretty much exactly the same. Beans grow best in slightly acid to neutral soil, pH between 6 and 7. Clay or silty loams are better for bean production than sandy soils. The reason sandy soils don't hold any nutrients, that's why. It, sand, sand is the largest particle soil that you will ever have. And the water, if it's dried out, it'll run, the water will run through. Sand is just silica sand. It's, it's like little rocks. Doesn't, doesn't really help anything. Um, use well-rotted manure or compost at planting to increase soil organic matter and purchase your rhizobium. Again, uh, if you, you need to fix that nitrogen in the soil or have well-rotted manure that's uh, going to help it aid in, the, in nitrogen. And can be planted two weeks before frost date. I'm sorry to uh, repeat myself. My, my apologies. Cantaloupe. That's such a cute thing. Uh, very tender, warm season annual. Do not plant cantaloupe unless your soil has reached um, 70 degrees. It, do, it doesn't like cold. Frost will injure the top growth and it needs warm weather to grow. Typically when you plant cantaloupe or any vining material like this, you'll, you'll have an area of compost that you'll put soil on top of and you'll, you'll plant two or three seeds in that mound and then as it grows and gets more space, or you pick out the most vigorous one and pinch out the other two, which is very hard to do, by the way. It's very hard to take out your baby plants to give room to the other plants. That's like picking the, fi the nicest child or, the, or whatever. It, it's, this is Sophie's choice. <laughs> I have never success, I've very rarely successfully thinned my plants. I, I just say, okay, everybody grow. Uh, medium requirements for nutrients. Uh, either from soil, organic matter, or fertilizers. Incorporate compost prior to planting and use a starter fertilizer for transplants. Now, if you'll notice, this cantaloupe is growing on a trellis. When you grow a cantaloupe on a trellis, it's very, very good. When a cantaloupe on the ground is likely to get soft spots, likely to go bad, like to get, likely to get uh, munched on by a critter. Um, if you have a trellis and you grow your cantaloupe vine up your trellis, you can take old socks or old pantyhose and you can make a little hammock for the little booger <laughs> and so it's swinging, it, not all that weight is hanging on that stem and you can <laughs> and your little, your little cantaloupe's just going back and forth and they're real comfy, they're real comfy so yeah, 
This is good. Cantaloupes in a hammock is really good. <laughs> you get <laughs> two to four fruits per plant, depending on the type and the cultivar. You can get little bitty cantaloupes too. Individual cantaloupes in a hammock. Be like a tropical vacation. <laughs> corn, sweet and super sweet. Super sweet corns were developed, I think, started to develop back in the 70s. That's your uh, uh, sugar queen. And uh, there's a white one. But they're super, super sweet. There's, you know, there's a bunch of different corns. Um, uh, your your old-fashioned butter and cream corns, those are just your sweet. And then your, your uh, silver queen, that's your super sweet. Um, moisten your seeds before you plant them. pH slightly acid to neutral. Uh, plant in a block. I don't know if you've ever grown corn. Corn is wind pollinated. The tassels at the top are where the pollen is. The corn itself, the corn is a seed. Um, and the, it's not a fruit. So the pollen from the top is going to fall down and land on the tassels on the, the corn ears. If you have a row of corn, the pollen's going to go over here, and it's going to go over here, and it's not going to do much for right here. But if you have five rows of corn, that's five by five, or, you know, don't plant it in a row. Plant it in a block. Do you see? Am I getting through? Okay. That's the best way to pollinate your corn. Otherwise, you end up with ears that have seed developed, not seed developed, seed developed, not seed developed. Then the next seed will be eaten by a worm. <laughs> then you'll have <laughs> seed developed, not seed developed. Um, fertilize at planting. Corn is a heavy feeder. Uh, the, according to what I've read, which may be true or not true, because it didn't come from extension, um, uh, the Indians used to put a fish head underneath their corn plants when they planted it. Don't know. I wasn't around, but sure. yeah. Uh, water it well, <laughs> keep it consistently moist, and shake your stalks occasionally to spread your pollen. Cucumber, slicing and pickling. This is another really good plant to put up on a trellis. Cucumber, uh, the cucumbers itself are a little soft skinned. The, the, They'll get insect damage. Um, they need rich, loose soil. They like heat, moisture, well-drained soil, and evening shade. Plant so that the plants grow vertil vertically, mulch it, and keep it moist. Eggplant is, again, in the tomato family, which is Solanaceae. Uh, eggplant needs warm weather and will not thrive during a cool season. When buying plants, choose sturdy plants up to one foot tall. Start eggplant seeds about eight weeks before planting them outside. Transplant outdoors after nighttime low temperatures are above 50 degrees. So actually they will take a little bit of cool because a lot of your warm weather plants don't like it below 70. Um, install plant supports at the time of planting and use mulch to heat the soil and reduce root damage. Uh, you can use black plastic mulch if you want to heat your soil before you plant. If, you, if, you, if you're so anxious to get out there and dig, you can put down black plastic and that will solarize your soil and bring it up to heat. Uh, when you plant your plants, you can even bring in soil, that you like in a potting soil, that you've kept someplace else that's a little bit warmer. You can dig your hole in advance or you, so that the sun has a chance to warm up that cavity in the, in the soil. Um, there's all, all kinds of ways to cheat. Um, okra. Besides having an incredibly pretty flower, um, okra prefers well-drained, sandy soils, high in organic material, pH 5.8 to 6.8, acid. Full sun. Seeds are soaked and then direct sowed. Fertilize with 10-10-10. Keep evenly moist. Mulch to control the weeds. If you want to see okra growing, uh, the, ag cult the ag center out at um, uh, on John Rice Boulevard, across from Paws, has a lovely, they, they usually grow some okra. The, and their garden this year is extraordinary. They just hosted the uh, uh, conference, the regional conference. So their, their garden right now is absolutely beautiful.
So if, if anybody wants to go check it out, it, it's exquisite. Um, and they've got some Cherokee purples too, dear. Um, to, to uh, yeah, that's my favorite tomato. So. Peas, field, that's your Crowder peas, your black-eyed peas, and your yard-long beans is what they call them. I, I m have always t felt like they tasted a little earthy to me, I, and, and so I, unless you cover it with a whole bunch of ham flavor or something. <laughs> um, plant your southern peas in full sun. They will tolerate partial shade. Grow southern peas in loose, well-drained soil. Southern peas prefer sandy, loamy soil. Soils rich in organic matter will increase productivity, but southern peas, like other legumes, are often planted to help improve poor soil. Again, it's a legume. The seed is born in a pod, so you know that it's fixing nitrogen. Um, add aged compost to growing beds at planting time. Southern peas refer prefer a soil pH of 6 to 6.5. I don't know how you feel about it. These are pretty cheap. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pick them up at, this, at the grocery store. Before COVID, a bag was a dollar. <laughs> I don't know what it is now because I still got the bag that I bought for a dollar before COVID. Peppers, hot and sweet. Peppers do well, best in soil with a pH between 6, 5, and 7. I keep mentioning pH. Y'all, it wouldn't be a bad idea to, to pick up a pH meter someplace just to see what you're dealing with, especially with the amount of limestone that we have in the soil here. Um, 6.5 and 7, keep consistent soil moisture level. Work well rotted manure or com compost into the soil in the spring. Um, hot peppers. Well, decorative peppers are edible. If it is a pepper in the pepper family, it is edible. Most of the heat in your hot peppers comes in the veins on the inside and in the seeds. If you avoid incorporating those parts of the plant into your, whatever you're eating, you'll avoid some of the heat. If you plant hot peppers and sweet peppers close to one another, they will, each one will, uh, pick up the attributes of the other. If you have a big sweet pepper over here and there's a, a hot pepper, a jalapeno over here, you will get some heat in your sweet peppers. <laughs> and you will get some sweet in your hot peppers. So, I mean, it's, it's a trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's really, really good. So, Okay, sweet potatoes. That's another plant that likes it hot, 70 degrees. One of our fellow master gardeners planted a, a uh, I think it was six by four, bed of sweet potatoes. Um, he got 200 pounds of sweet potatoes at the end of the growing season. Floyd. Um, planted from slips. I don't know, have, you, have any of you ever started slips? You take a toothpick and you put it in a sweet potato um, and you suspend it in a glass of water. Eventually the plant will start to throw off roots and you get growth out of the thing so then you cut a piece with the root and the and the growing part and that's what you plant. But that's how you start sweet potatoes or you can buy sweet potato slips. The uh, the green and the burgundy colored sweet potatoes that you buy to put in your decorative planters right now when you're making your pots for your porch, those are at the end of the season when you dump those out there more than likely be a, a potato in there and those are also edible. That That's still a sweet potato. Uh, plant in mounded earth in the ground. It's actually a root. Uh, it's a it's a storage mechanism for to store carbohydrate till next year when it can throw off more plant. And it's not related to yams. Pumpkin. Plant your pumpkins in early summer near the edge of your garden. Improve your native soil by mixing in several inches of aged compost or other rich organic material. Pumpkins require a lot of water. It's best to use soaker hose or drip or irrigation and avoid wetting the leaves. Evidently, as you can see from this picture, there's powdery mildew involved with wetting the leaves. Um, as pumpkins start to form, elevate them. This is another plant that would benefit from a hammock. <laughs> and 
uh, to prevent the soil from rotting, or plant the, prevent the plant from rotting. Harvest the pumpkins once they reach their ideal color. The skin should be firm and stems will have started to, to uh, wither. I've got a small pumpkin patch started for the kids in the corner of the yard, just from volunteer seeds that were left there from last year. So we'll see how it goes. There's all kinds of pumpkins. There's your, your big orange ones and your small orange ones and your white ones, and the white ones are so stinking cute. Um, but yeah, all kinds of pumpkins. Squash, summer squash. There is a new summer squash that grows vertically now. You might have to uh, uh, train it to a trellis or a, a stake of some sort, but instead of the squash laying over and the yellow squash falling off like it does, you can, you can attach it to a, a stake and the yellow squash comes off the side. And it, as it goes up, you get more and more. It, it's cool looking. Uh, mulch for even moisture and weed control. Plant in a mound over well composted manure or compost. Include zucchini and yellow squash. These are both summer squashes. And there's the patty pan squash too, but I don't have a lot of experience with that. Does anybody else? Patty pan, the little, the ones that look like a cap, a turban. Okay, you can get your winter squash. They'll have a little bit heavier uh, outside uh, and, and won't rot as readily. And uh, moderate fertilizer needs, compost, rotted manure, chemical fertilizer, all these vines we've been talking about, if you put a, a nice mound of compost or, or uh, manure and then put some dirt on top of it and poke your seeds in, that, that's how we're doing this. Um, water regularly and deeply and remove weeds regularly. I'm not big on uh, chemical weed removers, except for when I have big patches that I have to do. I'm not good. Uh, I did attend a class this last weekend where the gentleman who was doing the weed spraying took his regular sprayer and he hooked up a, a, um, a funnel, the three for a dollar funnels you get at Dollar Tree or Tractor, whatever. The, and he taped it to the bottom of his sprayer so that the spray would not be broadcast but he could very specifically do individual weeds without damaging the plants that were nearby. And he also added dye. You can either add food coloring dye or you can, or you can get online and look up plant dyes, you know. And he put the dye in the solution and that way when he hit that weed with that spray, he knew. And, when he, and tomorrow he also knows that that plant was already sprayed. And it was, it was pretty cool. The dye was purple. It, uh, it's probably still up there. It's at the Ag Center in the front where they do the grass demonstrations. I don't know if you all realize that, but they have different kinds of grass growing in the front of the property, and you can see which one grows best. Tomatoes. Everyone's favorite. Uh, determinate versus indeterminate. I don't know if you're familiar, if you're a canner. Um, or, or what you want your tomatoes for. A determinate plant will grow to a certain point, put out a flush of tomatoes, and that'll be the end of it. It won't give you a whole lot more. An indeterminate plant grows, sets out tomatoes. Then, since all tomatoes are technically vines, then it grows some more, and it puts out more tomatoes. Then it grows some more, and it puts out more tomatoes. Now, comparatively, they may put out the same amount of tomatoes. The determinant may just put out X number of pounds of tomatoes. So if you want to can or preserve in any way, you want to go after the determinant because you're going to get a whole bunch of tomatoes at one time. But if all you want is a tomato, uh, uh, bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, you might want to go with the indeterminate because you're going to get tomatoes throughout the year. Uh, one of the biggest problems with tomatoes is uh, end rot, uh, blossom end rot. That's when you have an irregular supply of water and it affects the availability of calcium in the plant and it causes uh, the first, primarily the first tomatoes that appear on the plants to have a rotten spot on their tip. You'll, you'll see it when it grows. Um, and uh, that's blossom end rot. Future tomatoes, as soon as you regulate the amount of calcium and the amount of water at what time they're getting, you won't have the same amount of problems. You get regular tomatoes that are not affected later on, and, and it's correctable. It's not, gonna, it's not a forever thing for the plant. 
And let's see, full sun, even moisture, blossom end rot due to uneven water absorption causes calcium shortage in fruit. We've already covered it. And yes, it is a fruit. Anything that holds seeds inside is a fruit. Watermelon. Warm weather. Crop 65 to 70 degrees. <coughs> Requires large amounts of space, water, and sunshine and nutrients. And a lot of mulch. <laughs> Okay, this is, uh, this is one of the pests you'll need to look for when you have your tomato plants. This, this little worm, it's called a tomato hornworm. He will eat your tomatoes. He will decimate it. He will eat half of your plant in one day. Or, well, it'll be actually overnight while you're sleeping, and you wake up in the morning and you go, what happened to my plant? And that little guy will have pooped all over the place, um, and um, in bugs they call it frass. He will have deposited frass all over your garden. <laughs> and he will have eaten your tomato plant. The tomato hornworm is parasitized by a wasp. The wasp lays the eggs on top of the tomato hornworm. When those eggs hatch, the larva from the wasp burrow into his skin, into his body. This, this is nature at its best. Do not kill that hornworm. <laughs> do not kill that hornworm. Do not. You can transport him someplace else, but do not kill him because he's a he's the host for the <laughs> the parasitizing wasp. Okay, keep this guy. I mean, keep these guys. Okay. okay. When you introduce a bigger pest to handle a pest, that's called integrated pest management. Sure. Yeah. So we don't use sprays or. I'm, I'm not saying I don't use sprays, but when you send <coughs> another pest to eat a pest, that's pretty good management. Okay, and the point that we're trying to make with this slide is the best way to ID an insect to find out how to deal with them is to look up the plant, the, look up, uh, if, if he's on a tomato plant, look up pests for tomato plants. If he's on a tobacco plant, look up pests for a tobacco plant, because that'll give you a much smaller group of insects from, from to, to try to figure out what to do w about them. Yes. <laughs> and pests like these do, you know, you will notice if you have a tomato horn, now that you're looking for them, you, you'll notice a tomato hornworm damage. <coughs> and that's it. That's it. Um, I greatly appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you so much.